Okay, so that's what we did in the last video here for reference. So if you remember, we were looking at Lorentz transformations or coordinate transformations in space-time. And so we said we want to consider only linear transformations, i.e. something that we can write as just some matrix of coefficients that multiply the old uh, coordinates. And so by making this sort of light assumption, and then by imposing the requirement that we want this Minkowski metric to be always invariant, to always have the same components regardless of the coordinates we use to express it, we were then able to, without knowing anything about the transformation, just making these two sort of assumptions, or really this is kind of an assumption and this is more of a, a requirement, we were able to derive the following three properties. We saw that this first property here essentially just is the realization that these lambdas are coordinate transformations because this formula has the form of the coordinate transformation law for a 0 2 tensor if we realize that these lambdas are going to be our Jacobi matrices. And so what this is really essentially then stating is that the transformation of the metric components into a new coordinate system is just the same as the original metric components. And then by considering this expression kind of fairly loosely taking the determinant, we were able to then realize that the determinant squared of this matrix is going to have to be equal to 1, or that the determinant of a single Lorentz transformation matrix is going to have to be plus or minus 1. We're going to see more about this coming up, but for now I just want you to keep this in the back of your minds. And then finally we were able to derive by just simply taking another partial derivative of this expression that the partial derivative of any of these lambda matrices is always going to be zero, which is basically just a restatement of this fact that the lambda is just this, a linear transformation that doesn't depend on the coordinates, and so the partial derivative is just zero. Okay, so without actually knowing at all what this lambda matrix is going to look like, we've already now found some fairly stringent properties that it needs to satisfy, and we already know a lot about the lambda matrix. And so now in this video I'm going to just introduce some lambda matrices, and we're going to show that they do satisfy these conditions. And then we're going to try and interpret physically what these Lorentz transformations actually correspond to. Okay, so I'll just make some more space and I'll rewrite our conditions. So our first and probably most important condition is that the metric is invariant under a Lorentz transformation. So the metric components are always the metric components, regardless of whether or not we transform. So if we start in some coordinates, the metric has this expression. If we change coordinates, we find that the metric is just the same as it was before. This is usually referred to as the isometry requirement that these lambdas correspond to what's known as an isometry of the metric. Essentially, they're a transformation that doesn't change the metric in any way. So that was our main condition. And then, sort of from this condition, we were able to derive some other conditions that the determinant of any lambda, now just expressed as a matrix, is going to have to be equal to plus or minus 1. Again, we're going to see a lot more of this shortly, but for now this isn't too useful. And then we just had the restatement of our linearity condition that the partial derivative of any lambda matrix is always 0. So, now what I'm simply going to do is just simply give you a lambda matrix, and we're then going to go through and check whether or not it satisfies all of these conditions. So I'm going to work just for generality, and so we can 
stick with how things are going to be in our universe. I'm going to work with a 1 plus 3 dimensional space time. So our lambdas are going to have to be 4 by 4 matrices. And now, okay, so let me just really briefly remind you what we're doing. We're transforming coordinates. So we're starting with some set of coordinates x mu, and we're transforming or we're multiplying those coordinates by a linear transformation. And we can fairly conveniently express these tensorial sums just using a kind of matrix and vector notation. So we can express the information contained in x mu. Remember, this is just kind of four objects representing each coordinate. So we have ct or x naught and then x 1, 2 and 3. All I've done is just re-express this x mu, just showing all of the components as a vector or just a column of numbers. And now we're going to hit that vector with our lambda matrix, whatever the lambda matrix is going to be. And then this is going to result in our new vector of coordinates. So this is the tensorial way of writing things down and you can just kind of think about these fairly simple operations just in terms of matrices acting on vectors. I'm going to have a little bit more to say about some subtleties to do with the matrix representation shortly. But for now let's just think about these lambdas as matrices. And so this is what we're going to be computing essentially, simply just a linear multiplication of a matrix onto a vector to give us our new coordinates. And so now I'm just going to write down what a potential lambda matrix could look like, and we're going to see whether or not it actually is a Lorentz transformation. Okay, so before we move on, I just want to make a quick comment about this expression. We've written it here in index notation, but as we've seen, it can be quite useful to express objects like this with just two indices as some kind of matrix or just an array. So we'd like to have some way to write down this lambda tensor. This is a 1, 1 tensor. We'd like to have some way to express it as a matrix. And we just kind of use now a convention that we for basically let the each index, we let the first one label rows and the second columns. And so the lambda matrix, we express um, in the following way. Okay, so this might be a way we would express each of these components, just arranging them in a matrix, so letting this Sigma index index the row of the matrix and the mu index the column. So any element just corresponding to a specific number index here, say the 0, 1 element, is going to lie here in the matrix set. So this is fine, we can just write down the sort of direct one to one mapping between this tensor and this matrix object, and now that makes calculations fairly convenient to do because then simply the coordinate transformation just becomes this lambda matrix multiplying our vector of coordinates so we write down some x mu which specifies our coordinates and then we hit that with some lambda matrix, and then that just, after we multiply everything out, that's just going to give us our new coordinates. So now how do we reconcile this matrix form of doing things with this more tensorial notation? Now this can be a bit confusing, and it's not very well documented anywhere, it just has just one of these things you need to kind of get used to, but I'm just now going to rewrite for you that this expression using our matrix language. So 
yeah, we're going to simply have that the metric, just now as a matrix, is equal to, now I can write it down, then I explain what it means. This lambda transpose eta lambda is essentially just the, the matrix way to write this tensorial expression. So these two expressions are completely equivalent. They are exactly the same. These two expressions are giving the exact same information. It just requires a bit of hand wavy thought to arrive at this lambda transpose from this expression here. But let me just kind of roughly explain how at least I think it works. I don't 100% know because this isn't ever well documented anywhere. This just kind of happens. But let's just have a look at it. So let's just look at this tensorial expression now. If I consider what's actually happening, well, we're effectively contracting these two tensors against this eta. So why don't we use the lowering property of our metric to lower one of these indices. So doing this expression, I'm going to have, let's, let's use this metric to lower, say, this sigma index and turn it into a lower row. And then we're just going to multiply by the lambda matrix again. And now what we have here is another contraction. We're contracting this row index. And now this is just what you need to get used to when you... Okay, so now we have to realize something that is just kind of a, not really a convention, just, a, just something that we need to do to get this to work consistently. We're considering contracting a lower with an upper index. Let's just step away from these multi-index objects and now just briefly think about what happens if we were to, to, to just contract a single index. Well, we can think of this first object with an upper index. It's kind of a vector of components. So we would represent that by now a column of numbers. But then this index with a lower subscript. And so the convention that we usually take is that upper index objects, traditionally what we would call vectors, are going to be columns of numbers. And we realize that these lower index objects that can sort of multiply against these columns, we realize as being now a row vector of objects. And so we only ever really know how to contract a row of things against a column of things. We simply just multiply row times column. And now just expanding this to matrices, whenever you multiply two matrices, you take a row and you multiply by the column. That's exactly the same operation happening here. And what we just have to realize is that whenever we do a contraction like this, just the kind of linear algebra way of representing that is by taking a row vector, multiplying it by a column vector. And so the linear algebra version or representation of this expression would be to write V transpose V, essentially take the column of information specified by V, transpose it, flip it to become a row vector, and then you can perform this operation. So what we need to realize with these now higher rank tensors, essentially whenever we perform a contraction like this, what's happening is that one of these is getting transposed so that we can effectively multiply its rows by the other's columns. And so whenever we have an expression like this, what we need to now realize is that one of these is going to be being transposed just so that the linear algebra works out correctly. Okay, so now this expression, what we need to realize, what well, one of these things is going to have to pick up a transpose so that this multiplication makes sense. And we need to remember that we raised, uh, sorry, we lowered one of these indices using the metric. So now how I would write this down, 
essentially I can say, well, we need to remember we need to transpose one of our objects. So we're going to have this first thing, let's transpose it. Uh, but we also need to remember that this had a factor of the Minkowski metric in there to lower this index. So let's call this thing eta lambda. And remember we transpose that, and then we just multiply it by another lambda. And now one way that you can view this transpose, if we look at this index row, the index that's being contracted, just kind of by convention, when we express these as matrices, we take the first index slot to represent rows and the second to represent columns. And so in these, both of these objects, this row index is in the row slot. Oops, not very good name. The row, the, le the Greek letter row index is in the slot that labels the rows of our matrix. And so to effectively multiply row by column, we need to transpose one of these, which is just going to kind of swap over the row and the mu index, effectively. And so that's what I wrote here. We just take our transpose. And so just now taking the transpose of a product of matrices just flips and transposes both of them. And we can just remember that the transpose of this eta is going to be the same thing because eta is symmetric. And so overall, this expression is giving us lambda transpose eta lambda. So that was a fairly roundabout and fairly loose discussion. And I'm not, I'll admit, I'm not 100% sure on if all of the details are accurate. But essentially, this is what happens. One of these lambdas, that's now the tensor, when we express it as a matrix, we have to do this transpose so that the, the multiplication works out correctly with our matrices. Okay, so that was a bit of work, but we've now realized that these are equivalent expressions. And now it just really turns, depending on the context, which one is more useful. If you're working with matrices, then this expression is useful. And if you're dealing with tensors, then this is the useful expression. So because I'm going to be working with matrices now for the rest of this video, I'm just going to um, remove this one and replace it with that one. But remember that they are the same. Okay, so now we have all of our conditions. We've conveniently realized that we can use this matrix expression to represent the isometry requirement. And then this is obviously a matrix expression, and this we can simply just forget about the indices and realize it also as a matrix expression. So what I'm now going to do is just simply give you a lambda matrix, and we're going to go through and check whether or not it satisfies all of these conditions that would mean it is a Lorentz transformation.